For years, UFO researchers claimed the US government was running a secret program to research and investigate the phenomenon. Time and time again, the authorities denied everything, telling the media and the public there was no official interest in the subject. Then, in December 2017, came a bombshell revelation. On this occasion, the conspiracy theories were true. There really was a secret government UFO project. And when the story broke, it wasn't on a UFO website or a conspiracy blog, it was on the front page of the New York Times. My name's Nick Pope. I worked at the UK Ministry of Defence for 21 years, and I used to run the British government's UFO project. Using my inside knowledge of government and my direct experience of having run a similar programme, I'm going to tell the story of the Pentagon secret UFO project. It's a big story. It involves the government, the intelligence community, and the military industrial complex. And it's a bizarre story with a colorful cast of characters that includes not just politicians and shadowy intelligence community figures, but a billionaire businessman and even a rock star. This is the inside story of a UFO program so cleverly hidden that its title didn't mention UFOs at all. This is the story of ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. To tell the full story of ATIP, we need to go back in time. We need to go back over 70 years to when it all began. On June 24th, 1947, a pilot, Kenneth Arnold, saw nine strange craft flying in formation over the Cascade Mountains in Washington State, traveling at a speed of well over a thousand miles an hour. The media got wind of the story and labeled these mystery objects flying saucers or flying disks. Further reports came in from other locations in the United States and from countries all around the world. What were these strange craft? What were they doing? And who was flying them? Then, as flying saucer fever swept across the nation, in early July 1947, something crashed in the New Mexico desert, close to an army airfield. The name of this base was Roswell. Wreckage from the crash was gathered up from a local ranch by military intelligence officers stationed at Roswell. Then, in an extraordinary turn of events, the US military reached out to the media and let it be known that they'd recovered one of these strange craft. A news release read as follows. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence officer of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc. At the time, the 509th Bomb Group was the only atomic bomb capable squadron anywhere in the world. Roswell was arguably the most strategically important military base on the face of the planet. Unbelievably, within 24 hours, the military issued a follow-up report claiming that the object had simply been a weather balloon. Could the military intelligence personnel at this elite military unit really have misidentified debris from a weather balloon? It's stretching credulity to breaking point, especially as the area concerned saw numerous weather balloon launches and personnel at Roswell were familiar with what these balloons looked like when they came down. Some believe the weather balloon explanation was a cover story, hastily ordered by senior military officers horrified that personnel at Roswell had revealed they'd recovered a flying disc. Some believe this was the beginning of a UFO cover-up that has lasted over 70 years, but which might now, as we'll see, finally be coming to an end. After Kenneth Arnold's flying saucer sighting, after Roswell, and with similar sightings coming in from all over the US, it was clear that the government needed to take action. Military intelligence specialists studied the problem. Theories were formulated, reports were written, but nobody could agree what these objects were. There were four main theories. 
The first was that all sightings could be written off as mirages, misidentifications, hoaxes or delusions. A second theory was that flying disks were secret prototype aircraft or missiles operated by another part of the US government. With information compartmentalised and restricted to those with a need to know, was it possible that one part of the government didn't know what another part was up to? The third theory was a variation on the second, but suggested these missiles or aircraft weren't American, but belonged to the Soviet Union. Might the Russians have developed long-range missiles or aircraft? And could they be probing US air defences, gathering intelligence, looking for weaknesses? It was a terrifying thought. The final theory began as a minority report, but gained ground steadily. The theory was that these objects were extraterrestrial spacecraft. Whatever the truth, the US government and military needed to know, and fast, while much of the research and investigation was done in secret, behind closed doors, military commanders recognised that if they wanted to amass evidence, they needed to ensure that people who saw these mystery objects could report them to the authorities. The United States was about to get a UFO project. The US government's UFO research and investigation programme operated from 1947 through to the end of 1969, it ran under three names, Project Sign, Project Grudge, and most famously of all, Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book investigated over 12,000 sightings, of which precisely 701 remained unexplained. These included cases where the witnesses were police officers, military personnel and pilots, and cases where visual sightings were corroborated by radar evidence. In many cases, objects demonstrated speeds and manoeuvres that were significantly in excess of even the fastest and most capable military aircraft. Project Blue Book even invented the term UFO, correctly judging that unidentified flying objects sounded more serious and scientific than flying saucer or flying disc. Project Blue Book's headquarters was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the very location where it was alleged that wreckage from the Roswell crash had been taken and stored. In 1969, the plug was abruptly pulled. For some years, it had been clear that the United States Air Force had been looking for a way out of the program. They commissioned the University of Colorado to undertake a study. From 1966 to 1968, the university ran a project known as the Condon Committee, so-called because it was chaired by physicist Edward Condon to review the Blue Book data. The Condon Committee delivered its final report in November 1968. It was a damning, sceptical assessment of the UFO phenomenon, and it recommended that no further government resources be used on investigating the mystery. The media, the public, and even some of the people involved with Project Blue Book were suspicious. It looked like a fix. The best cases in the Blue Book archives had been ignored, and undue prominence had been given to sightings where conventional explanations had been found. These objections were ignored, and on December 17, 1969, Project Blue Book was officially terminated. In terminating the project, the United States Air Force gave these carefully scripted reasons. 1. No UFO reported, investigated and evaluated by the Air Force has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. 2. There has been no evidence submitted to or discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorised as unidentified represent technological developments or principles beyond the range of present-day scientific knowledge. 3. There has been no evidence indicating that sightings categorised as unidentified are extraterrestrial vehicles. The then Secretary of the Air Force, Robert Siemens Jr, summarised the position by stating that Blue Book could no longer be justified either on the ground of national security or in the interest of science. 
Are we really to believe that from 1970 onwards the US government ignored all reports of unidentified objects in their airspace? This would be ridiculous. No government and no air force on Earth could fail to react if their own pilots saw UFOs and if their own radar operators tracked them, all of which was happening. Project Blue Book may have been terminated, but UFOs didn't go away. Sure enough, the clues were there, suggesting that in parallel with Project Blue Book, a secret reporting system existed, where even if the public were cut out, the military could continue to report UFOs. In a memo dated October 20th, 1969, Brigadier General Carol Bolander stated, Reports of unidentified flying objects which could affect national security are made in accordance with JNAP 146 or Air Force Manual 55-11 and are not part of the Blue Book system. The US government's UFO project had gone dark. The trail had gone cold. It would be decades before it emerged from the shadows, but when it finally did, everything would change. For years, after the termination of Project Blue Book, anyone who asked about UFOs was told there was no official involvement. Whether you were a senator, a journalist, or a member of the public, the answer was always the same. It didn't matter if you asked your question to the Department of Defense, the CIA, NASA, or anyone else. The response was identical. We're not interested. We don't investigate. But they did. In 2007, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid quietly got together with two like-minded colleagues, both now deceased, Senator Ted Stevens and Senator Daniel Inouye. They instigated a program known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. To add to the confusion about this project, it's also been described as the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, and the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program. Irrespective of the title, the brief was clear. Investigate and evaluate all aerial objects and phenomena that might pose a threat to the air defense of the United States. In some cases, such objects might be secret prototype aircraft, missiles, or drones. In other cases, they were UFOs. Harry Reid's interest in UFOs stems from his friendship with Nevada-based billionaire Robert Bigelow, who made his fortune in the hotel business, but who now runs an aerospace company that, among other things, constructs space station modules, and whose clients include NASA. Bigelow also owned a sprawling 500-acre property in Utah, known as the Skinwalker Ranch, where numerous UFO sightings and other paranormal events were witnessed and investigated by the National Institute of Discovery Science, a privately funded organization that Bigelow created to investigate UFOs, the unexplained, and fringe science. Bigelow also channeled funds to the Mutual UFO Network, the world's largest civilian UFO research organization. One of Bigelow's initiatives with MUFON was to fund the creation of a rapid response team that was deployed immediately in the aftermath of a significant UFO incident to interview witnesses and to recover evidence. Aside from Robert Bigelow, Harry Reid had discussed the subject with astronaut John Glenn, who was concerned that UFO sightings weren't being properly investigated especially in cases where the witnesses were military pilots and where the objects were tracked on radar. He felt that after Project Blue Book was terminated, pilots were reluctant to report sightings up the chain of command for fear that they'd be disbelieved, ridiculed, or even grounded due to concerns about their state of mind. ATIP was run from the Pentagon, but the program was owned not by the Department of Defense, but by the super-secret Defense Intelligence Agency, officially designated as a DOD Combat Support Agency. From their website, the DIA mission is described thus. We produce, analyze, and disseminate military intelligence information to combat and non-combat military missions. 
we serve as the nation's primary manager and producer of foreign military intelligence and are a central intelligence producer and manager for the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Unified Combatant Command. Now here comes an interesting twist in the story. While the DIA owned ATIP, much of the work was contracted out into the private sector. This often happens with specialist projects where there may be insufficient in-house expertise, and leveraging the knowledge and resources of defence contractors can have considerable advantages. Whether intended or not, it can, for example, make congressional scrutiny more difficult. And critically, can take much of the work outside the scope of the Freedom of Information Act. The UK Ministry of Defence did the same thing with some highly classified UK defence work, especially projects that could be considered somewhat out there and thus politically embarrassing. So guess who got the ATIP contract? Bigelow Aerospace. Officially, at least, ATIP ran from 2007 to 2012. During that time, around $22 million was spent on the project. It doesn't sound much when you consider that the annual US defense budget runs to around $600 billion, and that's just the way they wanted it. It was small enough to fly under the radar and not attract attention. And in the murky area of government accounting, it all depends how you do the math. $22 million may be the additional cash costs, but if you include the costs of the resources used, things like military radar systems and imagery analysis capabilities, the costs are much higher. So what exactly did ATIP do? To answer that question, we need to know something about the man who ran the program. Step forward, Luis Elizondo. Luis Elizondo is a man who's lived most of his life in the shadows. That's until October 2017, when, having resigned from the US government under dramatic circumstances, he blew the whistle on ATIP and revealed what much of the world already suspected, namely that the US government was investigating UFOs after all, despite the denials. So who is Luis Elizondo? After studying microbiology, immunology, and parasitology at University of Miami, Elizondo joined the US Army, wanting to serve his country. He quickly found that he had an aptitude for intelligence work and served in a number of different roles and theaters, many details of which are still classified. In view of his particular skills and his love of intelligence work, he soon left the Army and went to work for the Department of Defense as a civilian serving in a variety of posts all around the world. Then, in 2008, his life changed forever when he was asked to join ATIP, which, as we've seen, had been set up in 2007 at the instigation of Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. When the director of the program moved on in 2010, Elizondo took over and filled the post until 2017, when he resigned from government service. Elizondo decided that his priority in investigating UFO sightings should be to answer two questions. What were these things, and how did they work? In other words, what was the technology behind them? He deliberately set aside the more provocative questions. Who's behind the wheel, as he puts it, and what's their intent? ATIP was beset by problems and controversies. There was the inevitable struggle for funding in a situation where there was intense competition for limited defense resources. And while they tried to avoid terms like UFO, the phrase had so much pop culture baggage that ATIP was always going to struggle to be taken seriously. They even came up against problems from more senior staff whose personal paradigms and religious worldviews were challenged by some of the ATIP data. That's one of the reasons why, in October 2017, Luis Elizondo decided to resign not just from ATIP, but from the Department of Defense, leaving after a distinguished 22-year government career. It was a resignation of principle. 
Elizondo felt that what he'd learned was too important to be hidden away. As he puts it, to do his job properly, he had to leave. He had to leave so he could be part of a process whereby the American people could have a serious conversation about this subject. Not about flying saucers and little green men, but about the important defense, national security, and air safety issues raised by the phenomenon. On his departure, Elizondo wrote a letter of resignation to Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, a man he admires greatly and under whom he served in combat, expressing his dissatisfaction at the lack of attention more senior Pentagon officials were giving to the UFO problem. It's a problem, he says, because these objects are in our airspace, outperform our jets in terms of speed and maneuverability, and remain unknown. To better articulate this point, Elizondo uses what he calls the muddy bootprints analogy. Imagine, he says, that each night before you go to bed, you set your home alarm system. But each morning, when you come downstairs, there are muddy bootprints on your floor. Sure, you haven't been attacked and nothing is ever taken, but there's still the major question of who's breaking into your house, how they're doing it, and what the heck they want. In the government and the military, if you're not sure what you're dealing with, it's prudent to assume that there's a threat and then be relieved if one doesn't materialize. That's a far better strategy than to assume a scenario is benign and then be unpleasantly surprised by something that turns out to be hostile. That was Luis Elizondo's mindset when he ran ATIP, and that's a big part of why he resigned. He makes another powerful analogy. If an unidentified aircraft penetrates US airspace, and it turns out to have Russian markings or North Korean tail markings, there'd be an outcry, and rightly so. People would be demanding answers from the DOD, the CIA, and the Department of Homeland Security. But with some of the cases investigated by ATIP, not only were there no tail markings, there was no tail. And as Luis Elizondo puts it, in that situation, it's just crickets. There's an embarrassing silence. It's all too difficult. No one wants to deal with it. So now we know something about this principled man who ran ATIP. What of the project itself? What did they actually do? And what was it that Luis Elizondo discovered that led him to go public in an attempt to raise awareness about an issue he felt was more important than his career. The answer to these questions takes us on a journey into the heart of the US government's real-life X-Files. In one sense, the core mission of ATIP wasn't that different to the mission of Project Blue Book. Calling the unit a threat identification program sets things out pretty clearly. It goes back to the fundamental point that if there's something in your airspace, you want to know what it is. And there are a few better ways of getting answers to those questions than analyzing videos, particularly when those videos come not from enthusiastic members of the public sending in grainy cell phone footage, but from Navy pilots who are chasing UFOs and recording the encounters on film, while further corroboration was provided by virtue of the fact that some of these encounters were being tracked on sophisticated military radar systems. That's precisely the sort of material that ATIP received and analyzed. And when the New York Times broke the story of ATIP's existence, they took the extraordinary decision to run a second article in parallel, detailing the story behind one of two videos, dubbed Tic Tac and Gimbal, that ATIP looked at and which had found their way into the public domain. The story that exploded into the public domain in the pages of the New York Times occurred in 2004 off the coast of San Diego and involved two Navy aircrew, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate. Each man was flying a Navy F-18 Super Hornet and in the middle of a routine training flight, the pilots were vectored towards an uncorrelated target that radar operators on board the USS Princeton were tracking. It was the latest in a series of strange radar returns that the Navy cruiser had detected over a two-week period, and this time, 
commanders were determined to get to the bottom of the mystery. Fravor headed towards the mystery object and spotted it just above the ocean. The sea was white, as if it was boiling. Suddenly, the object accelerated towards him before veering away. Unable to see it, the aircraft were vectored to a rendezvous point some 60 miles away, only to be told by an astonished radar operator that the mystery object had appeared at the precise location they were heading for, while the two Navy jets were still 40 miles away. I have no idea what I saw, Fravor said, but I want to fly one. My gosh, there's a whole fleet of them. Look at that thing. Another unidentified pilot loudly exclaims in a second video. The footage was taken by an advanced targeting forward-looking infrared pod. And in a humorous twist, the makers, Raytheon, rushed out a press release boasting about how their technology was used in US government UFO hunting. Shortly before his resignation from government service, Luis Elizondo played a part in getting three videos, Tic Tac, Gimbal, and a third video that wasn't made available with the first two, declassified by the US government. This was partly to educate the wider aviation community about something that could be an air safety hazard, and partly an attempt to further the investigation by seeing whether circulating these videos more widely might provide some answers. Might the scientific community, for example, be able to shed light on encounters that the US government had been unable to explain? Luis Elizondo has implied there are dozens more videos out there and has expressed the hope that these two can be made public in the near future. One of the most bizarre aspects of the ATIP story is the allegation that the program was in possession of mystery metals. The normally cautious New York Times breathlessly reported that part of ATIP's budget was spent on modifying buildings at Bigelow Aerospace for the purpose of storing metal alloys and other materials that it was claimed had been recovered from UFOs. Could this be a reference to the long-forgotten Roswell debris? This question has yet to be answered, but irrespective of this, let's be very clear. The science is simple. There are no mystery metals. In chemistry, Everything sits somewhere on the periodic table, so the constituent elements of any material can be determined. It gets better than this. There are tests that can tell whether or not material has been in space, such as those that involve examining isotopic ratios or looking at ionization. This will show whether the materials have been exposed to cosmic rays. The differences arise because Earth's atmosphere protects us from these cosmic rays. These sorts of tests are done on meteorites to differentiate them from terrestrial rocks. If any materials were exposed to cosmic rays, it doesn't prove they came from an extraterrestrial spacecraft, as they might have come off a satellite or a rocket, but it certainly narrows things down. These tests are so obvious to chemists and material specialists that there's no way they won't already have been done. Bigelow Aerospace must know the results of these tests. These findings will have been briefed back to ATIP project managers at the DIA. If there are any anomalies here, the US government will already know about them. Luis Elizondo chooses his words very carefully when discussing this super sensitive aspect of ATIP's work. Yet, in one sense, he's been outspoken about this aspect of the project, an aspect that might just be the biggest smoking gun of all time. In one interview, Elizondo addressed the speculation about these mystery metals. He was insistent. He described them as meta-materials. He said that not only had the isotopic ratio analyses been conducted, but that the results were in. Incredibly, the results showed unique isotopic ratios that could only have resulted from these materials having originated from beyond this Earth. One of the most extraordinary parts of ATIP's activities relates to the study not of videos or even metals, but of people. Over the years, 
hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings have been logged and investigated, some by government programs, others by civilian research groups such as MUFON. While many of these sightings involved UFOs seen at distance, others have been decidedly up close and personal. There are some cases where it's claimed witnesses got so close to a UFO that there were physical effects, and sometimes even injury and illness, burn marks, suspected radiation sickness. If UFOs are powered, as many suspect, by some form of exotic energy source, it's certainly possible to speculate that getting too close might be dangerous. And in case anyone thinks this is paranoid nonsense spouted by conspiracy theorists, it isn't. It's the official view of the British government. Case in point, Rendlesham Forest. This is the UK's best-known UFO incident, and it's been called Britain's Roswell. In December 1980, a UFO landed in a forest that lies between two US military air bases. There were three nights of sightings, and on the third night, the witnesses included the deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. On the second and third night, the UFO was seen in the skies directly over the forest and the bases. But on the first night, a small triangular-shaped craft actually landed in Rendlesham Forest. Two airmen were sent to investigate, John Burroughs and Jim Penniston. They got very close, perhaps too close. Penniston says he touched it. For years afterwards, the men suffered health problems. Now, we think we know why. A few years ago, the British government started declassifying and releasing its UFO files. There were hundreds of documents on the Rendlesham Forest incident. They included a Defence Intelligence staff assessment of anomalous radiation readings that had been found at the landing site during the official investigation. The document stated that the levels of radioactivity appeared to be significantly higher than the average background. There was a further and much more sinister confirmation. A more general intelligence assessment of the UFO phenomenon, known as Project Condyne, contained speculation about what had happened to Penniston and Burroughs as a result of getting too close to the UFO. The study's final report had originally been classified secret UK eyes only, and under the heading Non-Ionising EM Effects on Humans and EM Field from a Plasma, the report states, The well-reported Rendlesham Forest slash Bentwaters event is an example where it might be postulated that several observers were probably exposed to UAP radiation for longer than normal UAP sighting periods. This report had almost certainly come to the attention of ATIP, given that one strand of the unit's work seems to have involved identifying people who'd got sufficiently close to UFOs to suffer physical effects and examining them for physiological changes. I'm personally aware of various close encounter witnesses who have been approached in recent years by scientists who were vague about exactly who they worked for, but who wanted to subject close encounter witnesses to a sophisticated array of medical procedures, including blood tests and DNA analysis. Directly or indirectly, it seems likely that these mystery scientists were working for ATIP and that the results of these analyses found their way back to the Pentagon. What of the science behind these mystery objects? What does ATIP's research and investigation tell us about one of the most intriguing questions about UFOs? How do they fly? Again, Luis Elizondo, the man who ran ATIP, has a possible answer, and it's a tantalizing one. Elizondo and his colleagues identified several characteristics that consistently arise with the best evidence to UFO cases. Time and time again, one or more of the following factors arose. Hypersonic velocities. Low observability. Sudden and extreme acceleration. Transmedium travel, bizarrely, some of these objects seem to move seamlessly into and out of the sea. 
positive lift. This seems to be a less provocative way of saying a phrase that sounds more like science fiction than science fact. Anti-gravity. Despite all of this, Luis Elizondo believes we're getting tantalisingly close to explaining things. He thinks a single technology can explain these various different characteristics displayed by UFOs. This technology, he believes, involves what he refers to as the metric engineering of space-time. It involves an exotic propulsion system that uses very high energy to warp space-time in a very local fashion, creating a sort of bubble. It sounds like something you'd see on Star Trek, but these are the conclusions not just of the man who ran ATIP, but scientists that Elizondo is currently working with on trying to unravel the secrets of these mystery craft. That's what ATIP did. But how did the story get out? How did a government UFO program the existence of which had been carefully hidden from the public, end up on the front page of the New York Times. At this point, in this expose of the Pentagon's secret UFO program, we meet another one of the colourful characters involved in this extraordinary story. Someone who played a major part in blowing the lid off the secrecy surrounding the program. The person concerned is none other than Tom DeLong the former singer and guitarist with the rock band Blink-182. Tom DeLong isn't the first celebrity to have developed an interest in UFOs. Musicians in particular seem obsessed with the subject. Some, such as John Lennon, had their own sightings. Others, such as Katy Perry and Kanye West, incorporate UFO and alien references into their song lyrics and videos. But Tom DeLong did something very different he became an activist. DeLong formed an organisation called the To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science Incorporated, usually just known as the To The Stars Academy. It was to be both a lobby group for the ending of UFO secrecy and an organisation that aspired to reverse engineer some of the hidden UFO technologies DeLong believes are locked away in Air Force hangars somewhere perhaps in locations such as Area 51, where UFO researchers believe recovered alien technology is kept. Tom DeLong wants to bring such technologies out of the shadows. The organization's mission statement, articulated on their website, is as follows. To the Stars Academy strives to be a powerful vehicle for change by creating a consortium among science, aerospace and entertainment that will work collectively to allow gifted researchers the freedom to explore exotic science and technologies with the infrastructure and resources to rapidly transition them to products that can change the world. It's certainly aiming high. But for those who might have been sceptical, there was an early clue that DeLong was emerging as a serious player. When WikiLeaks published emails from President Obama's former Chief of Staff, John Podesta, included among them was correspondence from Tom DeLong, briefing Podesta on his initiative. DeLong was pushing at an already open door. Podesta is a UFO believer and a fan of the X-Files, and his occasional UFO-themed tweets have been major news stories. At the time the emails leaked, Podesta was playing a major role in Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, a campaign marked by the extraordinary spectacle of Clinton going on to the Jimmy Kimmel show and correcting the bemused chat show host when he asked about UFOs, telling him, you know, there's a new name. It's unexplained aerial phenomenon, UAP. That's the latest nomenclature. In an early media interview, Hillary Clinton had said that if she was elected president, she'd do her best to find out what was going on at Area 51, the secret site that many associate with covert government research on crashed UFOs. Bill Clinton, too, had expressed interest in the subject when he was president. DeLong told Podesta that he was putting together a team, with assistance from General William McCasland formerly commander of the Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 
another site that's been linked with UFOs, and indeed the location where many believe that whatever crashed at Roswell was taken. Another of DeLong's advisors was Major General Michael Carey, Special Assistant to the Commander, Air Force Space Command. A rock star, rubbing shoulders with presidential chiefs of staff and generals. Again, it sounds bizarre, but today it seems that strange is normal. And whatever the truth of DeLong's exact relationship with people like Podesta, McCasland and Carey, the fact of the matter is, he did indeed put together a team of heavy hitters with close government ties. Members of DeLong's To The Stars Academy team include a very credible list of participants. Jim Semivan, a former senior member of the CIA. Dr. Hal Putoff, a scientist who's advised NASA, the DOD and the intelligence community. He specializes in exotic propulsion systems and energy sources. Steve Justice, a retired program director with the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, where numerous exotic aircraft have been designed and developed. Chris Mellon, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence in the Clinton and Bush administrations, who also served as the Minority Staff Director of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. This is the team that Luis Elizondo is now a part of. The fact that so many of these people have such close links with government, the military and the intelligence community has led to speculation that the whole venture is a government initiative in all but name. It's certainly true that many of these people were involved with ATIP. Luis Elizondo ran the program, while Putoff helped write the bid that landed Bigelow Aerospace the ATIP contract. Working out the complicated interrelationships between all these people can certainly be tricky, and sometimes it's difficult to see quite where the lines are drawn between ATIP, Bigelow Aerospace, and the To The Stars Academy, especially when so many of the players are the same. On October 11, 2017, Tom DeLong held a press conference where he and most of the To The Stars Academy team unveiled their initiative. It was an eloquent and passionate exposition of their mission statement, with the clear implication that many of the world-changing technologies they hope to develop are going to be based on things currently being kept under wraps by the US government. If those technologies are derived, as some believe, from crashed UFOs, then we may be talking about the exotic energy sources and propulsion systems that we'd need for viable interstellar travel. That certainly seems to be the aspiration implied by the organization's name. Is this the technology that will take humanity not just to the moon, but to the stars? Do we already have that technology somewhere in the deep state? And is the secrecy finally coming to an end? For years, there have been rumors that there's a UFO cover-up, but that some of those involved want to end it. There are stories about factions within the intelligence community at war with each other over the UFO issue. Some want disclosure, others don't. Are the ATIP revelations the final moves in a struggle that's gone on for over 70 years? Are we finally entering the end game? The October 2017 press conference generated significant media coverage, but to create an even bigger impact, another heavy hitter with close ties to government was needed. The person concerned was investigative journalist Leslie Kane. Kane isn't a member of the To The Stars Academy team, but knows or has met most of the key players and has supported their efforts through her journalism. She's written extensively about the UFO issue for the mainstream media and published a best-selling book on the subject, which featured statements from various generals, pilots and government officials who'd either seen a UFO themselves or been involved in official investigations. John Podesta wrote the foreword, and as a further illustration of her insider status, her uncle is Thomas Kane, the former governor of New Jersey who chaired the 9-11 Commission. 
Leslie Kane wrote two articles for the Huffington Post about the To The Stars Academy, but then she reached out to a long-term contact, Ralph Blumenthal, an investigative journalist at the New York Times. The Times has hardly ever covered the topic of UFOs, but Kane briefed Blumenthal on the To The Stars Academy and on ATIP, and set up a meeting with Luis Elizondo. Before the Times would publish the story, they went through a meticulous fact-checking process. This included getting confirmation from Senator Harry Reid, who'd instigated the program, interviewing Luis Elizondo, who'd headed it up, and acquiring documentation that confirmed the existence of the program, including some of the contracts dealing with the congressional appropriation. There was also a letter from Senator Reid requesting that ATIP be given restricted special access program status. The final piece of the puzzle was provided when another Times journalist met with a Pentagon spokesperson who confirmed the existence of the program. The press is rolled, and on December 16, 2017, the New York Times published the twin stories, one about ATIP, and the other one about David Fravor and Jim Slate's spectacular mid-air encounter with a UFO captured on film. When the New York Times first revealed the existence of ATIP, the Washington Post and Politico soon followed with stories of their own. This was followed by news reports and interviews with some of the key players running on most of the major TV networks. Here was the mainstream media, which traditionally either ignores or ridicules the topic, giving it extensive, positive coverage. As often as not, it was the science correspondent writing the story up in the newspaper reports. But what did the government say? In writing up their stories, the Times and the Post approached the DoD and the DIA for comments. Indeed, it was part of the meticulous fact-checking process, and the stories wouldn't have been published at all if the government hadn't confirmed, reluctantly, that yes, they had a program. Once the initial stories had been published, the floodgates opened. The world's media besieged these agencies with questions. So what did they say? What they always say when asked about UFOs. As little as they can get away with. The policy is always the same. Downplay everything. For the record, here are the official statements that the Pentagon has made. The Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program ended in the 2012 timeframe. It was determined that there were other, higher priority issues that merited funding, and it was in the best interest of the DoD to make a change. When asked if UFO sightings were still being investigated, despite the claim that funding had been cancelled, the same spokesperson had this to say. The DoD takes seriously all threats and potential threats to our people, our assets and our mission, and takes action whenever credible information is developed. When the ATIP story broke, UFO skeptics, particularly the aggressive, debunking kind, were at a loss as to how to respond. Their worst nightmare had just come true. For years, they delighted in portraying people who claimed the US government was secretly investigating UFOs as conspiracy nuts. But these so-called conspiracy nuts had turned out to be irrefutably and demonstrably correct. The believers had the Navy videos of military jets chasing UFOs. They had Senator Harry Reid, who confirmed everything and added, I'm not embarrassed or ashamed or sorry. I got this thing going. They had Luis Elizondo speaking on the record. They had the New York Times fact-checking the story by having had sight of some of the contractual documentation and by speaking to others associated with ATIP. Finally, the icing on the cake. They had the Pentagon confirming the story was true. So what did the skeptics have? Not a lot. There were some half-hearted attempts to explain away the videos in terms of various mutually contradictory theories, ranging from drones and reflections through to technical artefacts of the infrared camera. At times, 
the debunkers appeared to have forgotten the testimony of the pilots themselves, who confirmed they had visual sightings of the object, as well as the object showing up on film. When Commander Fravor gave an interview in which he said the object he chased accelerated like nothing I've ever seen, debunkers resorted to the unsubstantiated claim that pilots don't make very good UFO witnesses. And they ignored other aspects of the story altogether, such as the fact that the UFO had been tracked on military radar. Even astrophysicist and TV personality Neil deGrasse Tyson got in on the story, with an interview on CNN in which he somewhat disingenuously described the footage as fuzzy video, before proceeding to restate his sceptical views about UFOs. There were other targets when it came to the wrath of the debunkers. Tom DeLong's To The Stars Academy was described as a money-making organisation, because it invites people to invest and become shareholders. In fact, the organisation is classified as a public benefit corporation, and the 63-page offering circular was not only filed with the US Securities and Exchange Commission, it was published on the To The Stars Academy website. Money-making? Perhaps, but money-raising might have been a less loaded term. The aim was to allow anyone interested to get involved in the project so they have a chance to play their part in bringing technologies they believe are locked up within government out of the shadows and into the light of day. Despite the sceptical criticism, the To The Stars Academy, it seems, has been quite open about its operation. Can the same be said about the government? When the New York Times published their story about ATIP, the DOD and the DIA were bombarded with Freedom of Information Act requests. After only two or three weeks, well over a thousand had been received. The system ground to a halt, with FOI staff sinking in a sea of paperwork. It's likely that most of these requests will be turned down as being too wide in scope, and that many of the rest will be rejected, either under the exemption covering classified information for national defence or foreign policy, or, if any information is deemed to belong in part to Bigelow Aerospace, under the exemption that pertains to trade secrets and confidential business information. If journalists or UFO researchers thought the Freedom of Information Act would help them uncover the secrets of America's secret UFO project, they were in for an unpleasant surprise. On the question of uncovering ATIP secrets and finding out what more remains to be revealed, there's another intriguing possibility. ATIP was the Pentagon's secret UFO project, successfully hidden for years from Congress, the media and the public. They certainly had lots of unknowns and lots of great evidence – testimony, technical documents, analyses, videos, even materials. But by their own admission, they didn't have all the answers. Maybe they had fragments of something that crashed, but from what we know so far, they didn't have an actual craft. And they didn't have aliens, dead or alive. Yet, for years, researchers have claimed that's precisely what the government does have. Could it be that the reason ATIP didn't have all the answers is that there was another program, so secret, so deeply buried, so cleverly hidden, that even ATIP couldn't find it? Luis Elizondo certainly admits this is a possibility. The US intelligence community is comprised of 17 separate organizations. As I know only too well from my own government experience, there are rivalries and jealousies between different agencies as they compete for resources, influence and power. One of the most common ways in which these tensions manifest themselves is poor information sharing. Especially in the case of highly classified information, intelligence officers are understandably reluctant to talk to one another. A classic example of this was 9-11, and the 9-11 Commission's final report stated that poor information sharing between the CIA and the FBI was a contributing factor. Even though everyone's supposed to be on the same side, the reality 
is that people work in silos. What if the rumours are true? What if a secret cabal, perhaps Majestic 12, have known about, managed and covered up the alien presence since the Roswell incident in 1947? Just because the Pentagon set up their own UFO program in 2007 doesn't mean Majestic 12 would reach out to people they might regard as the new kids on the block. And smart though Luis Elizondo and his colleagues were, if Majestic 12 is real, maybe ATIP didn't find them. UFO secrecy is like an onion. Every time you peel away a layer, there's another one underneath. Now we know about ATIP, what else might there be? And could the revelation about ATIP have been a deliberate tactic? The best way to stop people looking for something is to convince them they found it. Now we've found ATIP, much of the UFO community has stopped looking for anything else. They think they've found the pot of gold at the end of the UFO rainbow. Maybe they have, but maybe they haven't. It's possible that outing ATIP was deliberate a clever tactic designed to distract people's attention from something else. The UFO community often talks about disclosure. They even spell it with a big D. It's the holy grail of ufology. To true believers, it unfolds something like this. The White House reaches out to the major TV news networks and other mainstream media outlets. They let it be known that the president will address the nation that evening probably during prime time. A press conference is duly scheduled, and the president steps forward and begins a speech that will be heard by almost everyone on the face of the planet, and which will fundamentally alter our knowledge and perception of who we are and what our place is in the wider cosmos. It will be remembered for all time, as we remember other speeches that changed the world. A day that will live in infamy, I have a dream. We can't predict exactly what will be said, but this will be its essence. My fellow Americans, people of the world, we are not alone. That's disclosure. It's a nice idea, but it's probably never going to happen. The problem isn't the existence of aliens. The problem is the inescapable implication that the government has known about this for decades, but lied about it. It would be a constitutional and legal nightmare, and would fundamentally undermine the credibility of political leaders. How could the government get around this? How about disclosure not with a big D, but with a little d? Soft disclosure, as opposed to hard disclosure, if you like. What would soft disclosure look like? Actually, it would probably look pretty much like what's happening now. A situation where a group of distinguished government, military, intelligence and aviation community professionals step forward, speak out and confirm that UFOs are real. It's a way of getting the message out without the government having to do it and having to face the myriad legal and constitutional consequences that might result from the open admission of a 70-year cover-up. It's a way of getting everyone to accept the truth without having to expose a decades-long conspiracy to suppress the biggest story of all time. Of course UFOs are real, people will say. I've seen it on the TV news and read it in my morning newspaper. That's soft disclosure. There's a related theory. It's called the acclimatization theory. According to the acclimatization theory, there's an organized government campaign to drip feed us the truth. Slowly, piece by piece, information will be revealed. Sometimes it might involve the release of documents, and on other occasions, it might relate to a whistleblower or to photos and videos of UFOs. Proponents of the acclimatization theory believe the aim is to soften people up, to gradually, over a period of decades, embed concepts of UFOs and aliens so deeply into our awareness that when the reality of extraterrestrial visitation is finally revealed, there won't be panic in the streets, but a quiet acceptance. It won't be, run for the hills, it'll be, I knew it. 
the bottom line is that you don't shock people by telling them something they already believe. Are the revelations concerning the Pentagon's UFO program part of an acclimatization plan? And if so, is it one of the final moves before the big reveal? Might we get hard disclosure after all? There was to be a final twist in the ATIP story. In a sense, it was the ultimate irony. For years, conspiracy theorists had suspected the US government was lying about UFOs, covering up the truth about an extraterrestrial reality. Now, with the existence of ATIP in the public domain, it was suggested there was a different agenda. Some people claimed that the government had made up the evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. They suggested that the real aim of all this was to bring about a false flag alien invasion. The false flag alien invasion theory postulates that the Illuminati, or whoever people might suggest is responsible for the UFO cover-up, are deliberately creating belief in aliens. In this bizarre worldview, there are no aliens. Rather, the powers that be are manufacturing a threat that doesn't exist. A combination of Hollywood special effects and government propaganda can fake anything you like. The second coming of Christ or, some believe, an alien invasion. It's been claimed that not only do such plans exist, but that the program even has a code name, Project Bluebeam. Faking an alien threat is what the man who developed the space rocket, Werner von Braun, allegedly described on his deathbed as being the last card. The ultimate way in which shadowy forces would make their bid to take over the world. Because if 9-11 brought us the Patriot Act, which many believe was a tool to take away various rights and freedoms, then a faked alien invasion could allow the Illuminati, or whoever these unseen forces of darkness may be, to sweep away not just freedoms, but the entire concept of nationhood. The world would have to unite to fight the common alien foe. President Reagan talked about such a scenario in a 1987 address to the United Nations General Assembly, and we've seen the scenario play out in movies such as Independence Day, movies that some believe are designed to embed these concepts into our awareness as part of an indoctrination process. It would, literally, bring about a new world order. It sounds like science fiction, but if it isn't, the revelations about ATIP may be a sign that the diabolical plan is about to be put into motion. When we assess the truth about ATIP, perhaps we should give the last word not to conspiracy theorists with their bizarre ideas, or to government press officers with their slick sound bites, but to Luis Elizondo, the man who actually ran the program. When he resigned from government service, he wrote a letter to Defense Secretary Jim Mattis expressing his frustration. He wrote, Despite overwhelming evidence at both the classified and unclassified levels, certain individuals in the department remain staunchly opposed to further research on what could be a tactical threat to our pilots, sailors and soldiers, and perhaps even an existential threat to our national security. An existential threat? Coming from a man who ran the Pentagon's UFO project, that bombshell phrase is probably the most disturbing statement ever made about UFOs by someone with inside knowledge of the subject. It speaks not just to the reality of the phenomenon, but to some deep and terrible secret about the true nature of UFOs and the true motives of these mysterious visitors to planet Earth. Thank <laughs> you.